So uh, I'm delighted to, delighted to introduce Sarah Blagden, who um, was a colleague at Imperial College until I drove her away, obviously. Um, but that, I, though I, I, I suspect I had absolutely nothing to do with it. On my, but, um, so Sarah is, well, is, was consultant in medical, medical oncology uh, and senior lecturer at Imperial until she was headhunted by Oxford University um, only very recently where she's about to, st to take up her position, but she co-founded the Phase One Oncology Trials Unit at Imperial and um, you know, has an interest in um, RNA binding proteins and post-transcriptional regulation of cancer. So um, I think she has talked a lot and has done a lot of work on LARP, which I'm sure she'll talk about, but also on um, other proteins that affect messenger RNA uh, translation and how they regulate uh, tumor cells. So. Um, I think that's just pretty much exhausted my knowledge of messenger <laughs> RNA at this point, so hopefully Sarah's <laughs> going to start speaking. I'm just waiting for this to load up. Great, thank you. Hello. Uh, hopefully that's come up, yes. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. Um, I'm going to be a little bit controversial. I hope you don't mind that. Um, so I'm going to talk about post-transcriptional gene regulation in gynecological cancer. Um, but I'm just going to start by talking about what causes cancer in a rather facetious kind of way over the history of time. So the cancer was actually first described in 1500 BC um, in ancient Egyptian scrolls. And a cure for uterine cancer was pig's ears, which I believe some people still use in Harley Street. <laughs> um, so there was um, that for a while, and then we came across the Middle Ages, and of course there was this idea of the imbalance of the four humors, and that you had a buildup of black bile, which was, uh, which was actually this, this section here. Um, and hence you had to have bleeding and cupping and goodness knows what else. Um, and that held sway for a century, mainly because it was considered, you weren't allowed to try and dissect any humans, corpses or otherwise. So people really didn't know anything about anatomy. And following that, in 1600s, um, Aselli discovered that uh, the lymphatics of the dog, and after that they came up with the foul lumps theory, which was that cancer was caused by an accumulation of ugly lymphatics, basically. Um, and then really the 1800s it all got very exciting, but really no answers about what caused cancer. It was very interesting though, uh, in 1926, a chap called Andrea Fibiger won a Nobel Prize for coming up with the link between s stomach cancer and a worm. Uh, unfortunately, his research was completely incorrect. Um, it was actually called Spiroptera carcinoma. Um, and that was one of the rather embarrassing episodes in the Nobel Prize histories, but, but no one really talks about that. Um, and then, of course, Watson and Crick described DNA in 1953, and then we sequenced the genome in 2004, and now, oh, sorry, yes, Tom, I found that you actually do give pig's ears, sorry, that was on <laughs> Tom's website, anyway. 500 pounds each, actually. <laughs> Uh, so we now appreciate the fact that cancer is a disease of the genome. But is it just another theory? Is this just another Andreas uh, Fibiger theory? I'm going to question that. So particularly in certain cancers. So uh, we know that transcription involves making messenger RNA from your genomic DNA, okay? And then the messenger RNA goes into the cytoplasm, and then you attract ribosomes, it translates around the mRNA, uh, there are a few modifications, but ultimately you get a protein. And that's how normal cells have normal activity. And what happens in a cancer, as you can see with that small triangle there, which I tried to show, a mutation, is that the mutation then causes a, a, a misformed mRNA, which then encodes a sometimes shorter, but it can be mutated protein that is different to the normal protein, and hence this goes off and causes havoc, particularly if it's a proto-oncogenic protein that with the, mu with the mutation becomes fully oncogenic. So the therapeutic approach that we have gone with since we sequenced the genome is to basically find a drug that targets the abnormal protein at the bottom here, um, but doesn't attack the normal protein. So you're basically saying, find the mutation and target the protein. And that is the theory that we've been sticking with. So you find, you design a protein that only works against your mutated uh, product and gets rid of it. Great. 
Good theory. But what about in ovarian cancer? Find the mutations. So where are the mutations? Are there any? So the TGCA data, which was basically the cancer database that came after they sequenced the genome, and they also COSMIC did a similar sort of thing. They looked at 489 women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer. They sequenced 180,000 exons for, and looked at uh, 18,500 genes, and they came out with ever more sophisticated technologies. And what do they teach us? Well, first of all, they've told us that ovarian cancer is very messy, and you've seen this carpet uh, before, I'm sure. But basically, it just shows that ovarian cancer here is genomically messy compared to something like glioblastoma. So it's very messy, and surprisingly so. But they commented, its mutational spectrum is surprisingly simple. They could only find eight significantly mutated genes. Everything else was copy number amplifications, chromosome translocations, but not producing fusion proteins that you could target. So can you target those mutations? Well, ones that strongly came up were P53, and we know that that's almost ubiquitous from the moment of the stick all the way through to the full-blown cancer. And yes, there are drugs that are being developed against it. The BRCA genes came up nicely, but all the others aren't targetable, either because they just aren't, or because they're not actually driving mutations. They're passenger mutations. They're just there, but they're not doing anything. So that's rather disappointing, because we've really only got BRCA mutations and P53 to work on. They had looked at individual mutations and tried to put them together in pathways and combine this with the cosmic database and show that there were pathways that were abnormal, like the RB1 pathway, but that's not something you can target at the moment. PI3 kinase pathway, but again, that's a passenger mutation. Notch, BRCA again, 20%. And you, we know about uh, Olaparib and PARP inhibitors. And they notice that there are homologous recombination defects in about 50% of people, and that's why they think that there are some of these chromosome translocations, but it doesn't go anywhere near enough to explain why the DNA is so messy. And if you look at this policy that we have had of find the mutation and target it, if you look at the 52 targeted medications approved by the FDA over a 10-year period, they have given a median overall survival of 2.1 months which is actually pretty bad. And if you look at the amount of the billions invested in all that sequencing, and that's all they've generated, and that in patients on therapy, it works out at $2.7 million rather, per life saved, which is an awful lot. Um, and that's really because they don't really work. And that's because the tumors are very heterogeneous, and there are numerous parallel pathways and resistance mechanisms. And even the wonderful PARP inhibitor, which as you saw, is about the only thing that we've been able to find that's a mutation. If you use PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer, even the best studies only show up to an eight month overall survival advantage. So what is the answer? Well, one answer is we just sequence more. Let's just find those driving mutations. Well, clearly the resolution on the sequencing isn't good enough. I disagree. I think we need to look elsewhere. I think that there are some blind spots here. We are blinded by this idea of this genomic cause for cancer, and we're not looking anywhere else. Ovarian cancer is highly heterogeneous. So if you look at it, it's like a sort of bag of Smarties. It's lots of different tumor types there. So you, I mean, sorry, individual cells with individual mutations and individual translocations. It's very hard to target with a targeted therapy anyway. We know that. We also now increasingly realize that there are stromal influences, there's the environment, there's immunology. There are other factors involved. And I'm going to talk about post-transcriptional regulation because we've increasingly realizing that that's important too. So if it was true that, I mean, originally they assumed that basically all the business was going on in the genes and gene mutations, and that this was inevitable. The messenger RNA to protein bit was inevitable. That was just going to happen. There wasn't any extra level of organization going on at that, that stage. If that were true, then the ratio between mRNA and protein would be one to one. That would be an R squared value of one, okay, so if that was true. And it was very interesting because Christine Vogel published a paper in 2010 in uh, medulloblastoma, actually, and the R-squared value was 0.29. 
So what she was showing that there was a discord between mRNA levels and protein. And similarly, and this hasn't been published yet, but in ovarian cancer, the R squared value is even lower. It's 0.14. So there is very little correlation between genome and protein. And that is a good argument for post-transcriptional mechanisms going on. And this can be because the messenger RNA is being made beautifully, but it's actually being either stabilized in the cytoplasm and in order to generate lots more protein, or it's being degraded. And if that messenger RNA is encoding an oncogene or proto-oncogene, if it's stabilized, it becomes very oncogenic in the cell. And if the messenger RNA is encoding a tumor suppressor gene and it's being degraded, then you can imagine that that is also having an oncogenic effect. So here you are, you've got perfect transcription, you've got your messenger RNA, but something's going on at that level, which means that you're producing loads more protein or too little, but the net result is abnormal cellular activity. So actually, if you look at the messenger RNA, it's a very complicated little thing. You've got the five prime cap, you've got loads of proteins that are stuck to it that are very important. And actually, they are directly regulated, not by the genome, they're directly regulated by external factors like growth factors and stress. And actually, they're also, the messenger RNA is regulated by a whole slew of RNA binding proteins that are stuck to it. And they are also directly regulated by growth factors and stress. So there's an external internal uh, system of communication that goes on between the RNA um, and, and the environment that bypasses the genome altogether. Now, I've been working on LARP1, which is an RNA binding protein, and I sort of talk about it. Um, in ovarian cancer and cervical cancer, it's upregulated. Um, but also in non-small cell lung cancer, if you have high LARP mRNA expression levels, uh, which is shown here in the red line, you have a poorer survival. Equally, in, in cervical cancer, as you progress up the CINs into invasive disease, you see higher levels of LARP, and in this case, we're just looking at protein levels. This is work we published last year. In ovarian cancer, we've seen a similar thing. At the top, you can see collections of Oncomine databases showing in ovarian cancer with different databases that higher levels of LARP correlate with um, cancer compared to benign. And if you look at protein expression, you see the same is true, which is the bottom left. And also on staining, you see uh, ovarian cancer stains with LARP, which is the brown staining, much more than normal ovary. So we now know, we, that LARP, which is an RNA binding protein, is obviously doing something to messenger RNA that is making the cancer become more unpleasant. If you look at the Scott Rock 4 data, and we stained a TMA taken from the, uh, from the patients in, involved in the study, uh, from their biopsies or from their, 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 uh, their actual sort of tumor taken at the time of their surgery, you can see that uh, high levels of LARP, which again are in the red, correlate with worse progression-free survival significantly, and also with worse overall survival. This is just one RNA binding protein, and there are a few that are linked to cancer, um, but I think we've got further with this one than the others in the cancer story. So to cut a long uh, story short, I'm going to run through these slides. LARP seems to cause cells to migrate faster if you overexpress it. It causes cells to invade. It drives anchorage-independent growth if you upregulate it. It promotes tumor genesis, and this is in xenografts. Um, you see the opposite if you knock down LARP. And then, so what does it actually do? How is it driving cancer? We now know that it's binding loads of mRNAs, like the, I showed you in the diagram, but mRNAs from lots of different, uh, encoding lots of different proteins. And it seems to be involved in binding mRNAs from a single path, from lots of single pathways. And these all seem to be cancer-sustaining pathways, particularly focal adhesion, mTOR signaling, and ECM receptor interactions. So um, involved in, in, in cancer functions, but particularly invasion. And we looked at the mTOR pathway and showed at protein level that that was true, that if we overexpress LARP, we see upregulation of the mTOR proteins. And equally, if we then went back to those, ma those mice in which we'd overexpress LARP, we can see much higher levels of mTOR, which is on the right, compared to the wild type on the left. 
So we found that actually what was very interesting was that LARP works in two ways. So I showed you the, the messenger RNA. I showed you that uh, RNA binding proteins bind to it. But actually by binding to the message, it makes some stable and makes others unstable. And we don't understand quite why it does that. It could be binding microRNAs. It could be uh, binding slightly different um, positions along the mRNA. We know that it seems to be interacting with the three prime end of the messenger RNA. But we also find that LARP is present in peabodies, which are subcellular structures designed to uh, basically degrade a message. Um, and we also find it in stress granules, which are designed to protect message. But what was even more interesting for us was that you see higher levels of LARP in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. And these are three paired pairs of ex vivo matched cell lines. And you can see that on the right-hand side, that's the resistant one in each pair, compared to the left-hand side, which is platinum-sensitive. But if we, if we actually remove LARP by siRNA, or we use short hairpin here, but we've also got lentiviral vectors we've developed, and the same every time, we reverse that resistance. Then we went on to look at whether we could detect the protein, because we're talking about biomarkers here in the plasma of ovarian cancer patients. We did a small cohort of 34 patients, and we saw that there were much higher levels in ovarian cancer than controls. We got quite excited. We then compared it to CA125 and showed that that LARP's uh, correlation with overall survival uh, gave a hazard ratio of seven compared to CA125, which had a ratio of one. So it looks like it's a really good predictor. So then we just went, approached IOTA and said, please, could we have your samples? And the results were, drum roll, negative. <laughs> So I don't know quite why at the moment, but anyway, um, you gave us uh, serum samples from 440, oh, sorry, plasma samples actually, from 447 patients. Malignant, 35%, benign, 65%. Uh, so that was the breakdown. Um, and we found that there was, uh, when we looked at survival of your samples, they behave perfectly. They behave perfectly according to grade and stage, et cetera. So the samples are right, the annotation's right. But we found actually the opposite to what we expected, that there was positive LARP expression in only 20% of cases. And we looked at stage and grade, and there was absolutely no correlation. So it was a complete whitewash. So I'm afraid the first trans iota <laughs> was negative. But we will rerun them because it may be something to do with the antibodies. So we're going to be reassessing it. It could also be that the protein gets rapidly degraded and needs immediate treatment. The plasma may need immediate treatment with proteasome inhibitors. So we're running a prospective study as well as reanalyzing your data to see if that it, it changes things. And that's the survival association, so not very good. I'll flick over that. But in summary, so what, what we have recently discovered is that, or, or my colleague Andrea Berman in Pittsburgh has shown the crystal structure and found that LARP actually, one end of it, dimerizes around RNA. Now, one of the reasons that people sort of don't really like inhibiting RNA is because they are concerned um, that you can't target it. Because I don't know whether you know, but people call druggable drugs kinases, basically. People love targeting kinases or receptors, but they're now broadening, broadening that spectrum and realizing that limits us a lot. And now they've discovered that you can drug things that weren't conventionally druggable. And we can see this little tiny X in the middle is supposed to be the RNA, and that's the dimer of the protein wrapped around it. And we've seen that there's actually a druggable region there. So that's the ongoing step with the project to try and inhibit it. So in conclusion so far, I have to say, I think the strategy of identifying and targeting mutations has not improved survival from ovarian cancer. So when Anne was going to put up her house uh, for circulating DNA, and don't. I, seriously, you'll be, you'll be in a caravan if you do that. Because I don't think that targeting mutations, sorry, you're there. I don't think targeting mutations is going to help. I mean, it's going to give you prognostic information, but it's a very expensive way of doing it, you know, just trying to sort of sieve through patients' blood for DNA. It's not going to help. Uh, ovarian cancer is heterogeneous, and there's a reason behind that. We still don't understand why. It's very genomically messy, more than can be explained by the HR defects. There's something else going on, and I suggest that that is because it's post-transcriptional. So something is going on at an RNA level, not necessarily just with LARP, but other RNA binding proteins and microRNAs that is influencing the genomic context. It's a bit like, so if we say, I think that some cancers might be genomic, but I think if we say that ovarian cancer is the disease of the genome, it's a bit like saying that the omentum causes ovarian cancer. It is involved, but I don't think it's causing it. And I think that's why we need to step away from the timeline and think really about a new direction for gynae cancer.
There is a poor association between mRNA and protein, which makes my case even stronger. And I've shown LARP as an example um, that regulates the mTOR pathway, correlates in our, with, with adversity with survival at mRNA and protein level, drives invasion, et cetera, as I showed you, and chemo resistance is, not, is detectable in plasma, but it's not prognostic according to your samples and is potentially druggable. But there are other RNA binding proteins, microRNAs, et cetera, that are emerging, and you're going to be hearing about them soon because we're talking now about trying to inhibit them. And the new buzzword is is going to be ribotoxics. That's going to be the future. So forget genotoxics, cytotoxics, ribotoxics is where we're going. So if you've got a situation where you've got really good genomic activity, but the, 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 the defect is going on at an mRNA level, I'll just go back on that one, then the aim is inhibit that and then restore normal activity. Um, so it's a bit like you're trying to sort of uh, kill the composer of an orchestra so that he, because at the moment what's happening with the RNA is it's turning up expression of some proteins, turning down others and creating the cancer environment. If you kill the composer, that then what will happen hopefully is the orchestra will return to a normal activity. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge the funding that I've had and the team at Imperial and, um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Any questions? Listen, you didn't mention Drosophila once. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite disappointed. I know. Resist um, the questions. Earth. Gentlemen there? I have uh, two questions. I guess uh, LARP is an abbreviation for something. L what, do what does it stand for? It stands for LAR-related proteins, um, and they are related because, do you know, when you get sort of, with Sjogren's syndrome and things, you get an anti-LAR antibody in your blood, and they track that back to a, a, a very ubiquitous and small protein called LAR, and they are related because they carry the same LAR domain, but they are larger. They have extra regions on them. There's a family of seven of them, and if you're interested, I have started a LARP society. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> and we have meetings every two years for enthusiasts around the world. I have one more question. The other abbreviation is HAVOC. Is what? HAVOC. What does Havoc. it stand, what does it stand chaos. for? Chaos. I mean, just chaos. Havoc. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's what, um, what I mean by that is abnormal protein expression and, and, and cellular chaos. I've got to argue about ribotoxics. I mean, how does that work? Well, I mean, we've, in the past, we've targeted, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. In the past, we've targeted DNA, and uh, of course, that's quite a scary thing to do, because you'd think that you'd kill everybody, but you don't, actually. You don't kill everybody. You kill the cancer cell. You slightly kill people. Uh, but if you can, uh, ribotoxics, if they are, if you can find something like an RNA binding protein or microRNA that just targets those mRNAs, and if you target that interaction, then the effect will be to tone down the RNA message. And so we, in, we just call them ribotoxics. And do you think you're going to have the same heterogeneity and problems of resistance effectively in these as you see already? I mean, what's to say that you're not going to have exactly the same problems? Quite possibly, but I th uh, yes, quite possibly. But it could be that if, if uh, tumor heterogeneity is an RNA-led phenomenon, then perhaps what you can do is try and inhibit that at an early stage to prevent heterogeneity or reverse heterogeneity. But couldn't you say that if you have a different uh, clones and they're different, some might be amenable to, the, say, ribotoxic therapy, whilst others more conventional therapy, and you can kind of knock off the whole lot at once if you well, can find a yeah. treatment that actually deals well, with both? I mean, actually, that's quite interesting. I know everybody's probably read the Gerlinger paper, which looks at the tree of heterogeneity. And this idea that some, uh, some cancers have very long trunks because they retain those clonal mutations all the way through their life. Those cancers are quite easy to treat. Um, it's the ones that where they get the extra mutations early on that are harder to treat. And really what they're trying to do now is find ways of classifying tumors into those two groups. So yes, you could be looking at, in the particularly furry tree, thinking more about trying to inhibit RNA, a much more general effect. Because you need multiple mechanisms to, yeah, be able exactly. to, to be able to deal with the cancers early because you know, you're giving people very toxic therapy with an inevitable relapse when actually if you could give them multiple types of therapy right from the start, you may have a chance of putting them into a proper kind of relapse and actually extending their lives because at the moment you don't do that, really. And the other thing to say, which I haven't really mentioned, is that stem cells and EMT are very driven by RNA mechanisms. And so you, what you might find if you inhibit RNA is you will have a specific effect against stem cells. So you could then combine with conventional treatment and have that sort of double whammy effect.
And I've learned the word druggable, which has been fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you.